All right, so I'm going to be talking about some research that we published this fall called uh, Change in the Magnitude and Mechanisms of Global Temperature Variability with Warming. And so in this research, we are focused on global temperature variability. And in particular, we're looking at global mean surface air temperature variability. So air temperature measured two meters above the surface, averaged over the entire surface of the planet. And we're looking at variability in global temperature. And in particular, we're looking at unforced global temperature variability. So that's the type of variability that's exemplified by pre-industrial control runs in global climate models. So this is 900 years of global temperature variability in the GFDL CM3 model, which is the model that I will focus exclusively on in this talk. And so in a pre-industrial control run, there's no changes in the solar constant, there's no changes in well-mixed greenhouse gases, there's no changes in anthropogenic aerosols, etc. So all of the variability that you see just emerges spontaneously from the internal dynamics of the ocean, atmosphere, land, sea ice system. And so we're interested in how this unforced variability might change with warming. So as we warm from a temperature uh, exemplified from the pre-industrial control era, into the future where we're expecting uh, much more warming, how does this unforced variability change? And so this has implications for how relevant pre-industrial control runs would be for understanding variability uh, both currently and into the future. Or if we find that global temperature variability does change a lot, it might mean that these pre-industrial control runs basically only tell us about variability in the pre-industrial control state. So the main experiment that we are analyzing in this paper is we look at the pre-industrial control run in this GFDL CM3 model, and we compare it to a similar control run, same length, so 900 years, uh, in the same model, except after global uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide has been doubled. So the model has equilibrated to its new warm state after CO2 has been doubled and so then you can analyze the new unforced variability in the new warmed climate state. So immediately you can see that the magnitude of variability has decreased particularly at these low frequency time scales. So the colored lines here represent variability at 15 years and longer and we see that that variability has declined and it's not specific to that particular time scale. So if we look at a spectral comparison, we can see that variability basically at all time scales beyond about a decade in length uh, has decreased in the model control run where carbon dioxide has been doubled. So then that um, tells us that the magnitude has decreased in, in this particular case by about 43%. Um, at, at these longer time scales. And so then that raises the question of what mechanisms uh, change in order for this variability to change the way that it does. So one way to look at that is to first investigate the geographic origin of variability in the two runs. So this is in the pre-industrial control run, and what this is a map of is local temperature regressed against the global mean temperature. So what this will show you are the locations that contribute the most to the global temperature variability. And so in the pre-industrial control run, we <clears throat> see that we have this, basically we have a bipolar mode of variability that's contributing to global temperature variability. And in particular, the Southern Ocean is really a strong contributor to global temperature variability. So now after CO2 has been doubled, and the magnitude has decreased, the geographic origins of global temperature variability are basically fundamentally altered in this warm state. So instead of the Southern Ocean being the primary contributor to global temperature variability, the model's North Atlantic region, or the model's Atlantic multidecadal oscillation, is the primary contributor to global temperature variability in the two times CO2 case. So we have, a, we have a decrease in the magnitude and we have a change in the modes responsible for global temperature variability. 
So to get an idea of why these modes change, it's useful to think about the global energy budget and its relationship to global temperature. So <clears throat> we can think of global temperature or changes in global temperature with time as being related to the energy flux divided by the heat capacity. So in this case, we can think of this equation as essentially being applied to the atmosphere plus effective mixed layer plus land system, where then the flux can be divided into two, two terms. So we have a term at the top of the atmosphere, which is often called N. So this is the net top of atmosphere energy uh, imbalance. And then a term at the bottom of the mixed layer, which I'll just refer to as QBML here. So that's heat exchange between the effective mixed layer and the deep ocean. So both of these terms are important, but it turns out that N is particularly illuminating in this case, so I will just focus on N for the rest of this talk. And so to get an idea of the relationship between global temperature and the net energy imbalance at the top of the atmosphere, we can summarize this with cross regressions against global temperature. So <clears throat> what these are are just linear regression coefficients against global temperature um, but at time legs. So this is 15 years preceding global temperature and time and this is 15 years following global temperature and time. And this is global temperature regressed against itself. So you're basically seeing a uh, autocorrelation function here. And so I can put on the net top of atmosphere energy imbalance in the pre-industrial control case here. And this is what that looks like. And we can essentially think of this, even though these are linear regression coefficients, we can think of this as being like a composite over a bunch of different unforced warming events in the pre-industrial control run. So we can think of this as being just like the 15 years prior to the peak in temperature and then 15 years following the peak in temperature. And so we see that as temperatures are rising prior to an unforced peak in global temperature, we see that N tends to be positive or into the system. And then as temperatures are falling, following a peak in global temperature, N tends to be negative or out of the system. So that means that the net top of atmosphere energy imbalance is positively contributing to and or driving global temperature variability in the pre-industrial control run. And so to get an idea of why that is, we can break N down further into uh, more specific components. So we can think of the net top of atmosphere energy budget can be broken down into a term uh, coming in, uh, net incoming, or just incoming solar radiation. Uh, which is then reflected to space by clouds as well as uh, surface uh, reflectivity or surface albedo. And then of course there's the long wave component. So uh, both of these, both the short wave and long wave component can be broken down into the cloud and clear sky components. And then since this is unforced variability, uh, the incoming solar component component can't change. So there's only four components that can change, but all four of these can change uh, in the unforced state or can vary in the unforced state. So we can think of N as then being the sum of these four components. So adding these components on here, here's N, I can put in the two long wave components. So we can see that we have a positive contribution from the cloud long wave component. So a positive long wave cloud feedback on unforced global temperature variability. We have a strong damping or negative influence from the clear sky long wave component. So that's just the Planck response in the system that as the system warms up, it ends up throwing more uh, long wave radiation to space. And that is our main stabilizing influence on the climate system. I can bring in the two short wave components we see that we have a positive shortwave cloud feedback. But the largest single contributor uh, to this positive N influence on global temperature is this very strong positive clear sky shortwave influence. And it even leads global temperature and time, suggesting that the clear sky shortwave component, which is really the surface albedo component, 
uh, that is essentially a driver of global temperature variability in this pre-industrial control run. And we can see why that would be occurring when we break out these uh, linear regression coefficients in space. So this is the clear sky shortwave local flux regress regressed against the global mean temperature. And we can see that this positive contribution to the global temperature uh, from the surface albedo occurs exactly where we'd expect it to occur. It occurs where there's sea ice that can vary. So what this is saying is that when you have an unforced warming event in the pre-industrial control run, you have a lot of melting of sea ice and thus like a positive feedback, a positive energy flux influence on that global temperature variability. So then <clears throat> looking at how that changes in the two times CO2 run, we can now add on here, switch back and forth between here's the pre-industrial control and here's the two times CO2. And you'll notice actually that the y-axis uh, gets smaller here, uh, showing that all of these components have become a lot less variable in the two times CO2 case. But if you break it down component by component, you can see that it's the clear sky shortwave component that decreases by the most. And what that ends up doing actually is that it completely changes the relationship between the net top of atmosphere energy imbalance and global temperature, such that you no longer have this relationship where the net top of atmosphere energy imbalance positively contributes to global temperature change in the two times CO2 run. So it ends up being the, the net energy imbalance at the top of the atmosphere ends up being negative uh, at, the, at the peak of an unforced warming event, meaning that you have damping at the top of the atmosphere rather than an enhancement of variability at the top of the atmosphere. And that occurs because you've lost this positive feedback or this driving mechanism from clear sky shortwave uh, radiation variability. And so <clears throat> when we look at where that decrease has occurred, we see that in the two times CO2 case, you've essentially lost this positive contribution from the Southern Ocean and from the Arctic Ocean. So essentially what has happened here is that once you've warmed the climate from the pre-industrial control boundary conditions to the two times CO2 boundary conditions, you've melted away uh, the sea ice. And so that sea ice can no longer vary and can no longer act as this positive contribution uh, radiatively to the unforced uh, variability in global temperature. So to summarize here, we see that the magnitude of global temperature variability decreases and the mechanisms responsible for that variability are fundamentally altered in this GFDL uh, CM3 model. So in particular in this model we see about a 43 percent reduction in the low frequency component of this global temperature variability. And this is something that we see in the other CMIT-5 models as well, although they tend to not uh, show as large of a decrease in global temperature variability. Um, something that we also see in the other CMIT-5 models is that the variability tends to decrease <clears throat> largely because you lose climatological sea ice extent, and so then you're losing the leverage that sea ice can exert basically as a positive feedback, a positive surface albedo feedback on global temperature variability. And so this has implications for how useful pre-industrial control runs are and or reconstructions of surface temperature over say the past millennium when we're thinking about unforced global temperature variability of the future. Because basically these results say that global temperature variability fundamentally uh, depends on the boundary conditions. And so warmer boundary conditions in the future uh, may mean that you'll fundamentally alter global temperature variability. And so it might be hard to infer the physics or statistics of future global temperature variability from uh, pre-industrial control runs. Thank you.